we are reading The Year of Miss Agnes by Kirkpatrick Hill. And these chapters are really short, so I'm going to start reading two chapters at a time. We're on chapter three. This is how we came to get a school. First, everyone in the village lived in Dolby. That's upriver. They never had school there. And it flooded so much at Dolby that people's stuff just floated away some years. And then everybody said, we better move somewhere else not so low. So the whole village moved here where we are now. I wish I could remember that. Some of the houses at Dolby were put on rafts and just they floated them down here. I would have liked to have seen that. Then Grandpa said some other people moved here because this is a good place. Lots of game. Pretty soon, the government said we had enough kids to have a teacher if we had a place to hold school. You have to have six kids or you couldn't have a school. That was the law. So they made a school in Old Man Johnson's cabin because he was dead and nobody lived in it anymore. And that's how we got our school. And I'm glad we did because I like school. When I got up in the morning, I looked out the window at the schoolhouse down by the bank. It was still dark and I could see there was already smoke coming out of the chimney. The last teacher could never get a fire going. She had to wait for one of the big boys, Roger or little Pete, to start it. Roger got funny one time and closed the damper when he started, so it just smoked real bad, and we all had to leave the school. The teacher was so upset, she said no more school that day, and she went to her cabin and shut the door. That Roger is just a nuisance. I was so happy to be going to school again, but Mama was mad. She was slamming things around. She didn't see the use of school. It made her mad to have me gone all day when I could be helping her at home. Baco was helping me get ready. I couldn't find my clean socks, so she gave me hers, which were pretty clean, even though there was a hole in the toe that she had never mended. I put them on when Mama wasn't looking, or she would have yelled me and maybe kept me from school because I didn't have clean socks and Baco's had a hole in them, and she'd yell at Baco for not darning them. I was glad to be going to school, but I felt sorry for leaving Baco. She didn't go to school because she was deaf. She was born that way. She was two years older than me, 12, and I was the only one who understood what she wanted to say. I just knew somehow. Mama wasn't patient to understand her. It had snowed a little in the night, and I ran all the way to school with that good feeling you get when it first snows and that good feeling from going to school. The schoolroom looked really different when I got there. The sun was just coming up, and all the windows were just shining. She'd washed them, even the corners that used to be gunked up. All the kids were there before me because of those socks. Miss Agnes had put a map on the wall, like the one she showed me and Bertha in her book. A big, big map of the whole world. It covered the whole wall, so the bottom was by my toes and the top was way over my head. I couldn't keep my eyes off that map. It was so wonderful. Right away I went to it and I stood on a chair and I showed those kids. This is Alaska where we are now and this is where teacher comes from. It's English. The teacher looked at me with a quick look and I could see she was pleased I remembered. On this big map, my fingers didn't cover the little English place. Miss Agnes had a record player that worked with batteries and lots and lots of records on the back table and a whole bunch of big books we never saw before. She must have brought them with her. There were some pictures on the wall by the windows, some kind we'd never seen before. They weren't pictures of real things, but they were just lines and squares and shapes of bright, bright colors all put together, not looking like anything, but really happy somehow. Everything was way different from any time we'd come to school before. For one thing, the desks weren't all lined up. Miss Agnes had put them in a circle around the edges of the room, and there was a long table in the middle of the room, and her desk was just back in the corner, not where it used to be in front of the blackboard. Desks in a circle looked like more fun somehow, and a teacher's desk in the corner looked more friendly-like too. Everything was different, but good different. Chapter 4. All the kids looked different that first day, too, like something good was going to happen. It was early October, and the river was just slushing up, and there hadn't been hardly any snow, so all the kids were there. After freeze-up, lots of them would go to winter camp to trap with their folks and would be there until Christmas. There was just me and Bertha and the big boys, Jimmy, Sam, and Roger, and little Pete, and the littlest ones, Selena and Charlie Boy, and the middle ones, Kelly and Plasker. I'm sorry, Kenny and Plasker. Toby Joe, too. And Marie, she was the only big girl. Me and Baco were mostly the only ones who stayed in town all winter. That's because we didn't have a dad. He died when we were little. They sent him to a hospital for people who had TB in Juneau. That's really far away. But he didn't get any better. We have a picture of him tacked on the wall at home. It was when he went to Nulado one time. There was this priest who had a camera, and he took lots of pictures of everyone. There's my dad leaning against the wall of an old store with a bunch of other guys. He was real young then. He has this kind of old-time hat, squashed up like. All the guys in the picture do, too. Mama said that's the kind of hat they wore then, back in the 20s. 
He has on those old kind of summer moccasins, the long kind that wrap up your leg a little ways. I know his mama made those for him. She died before I was born, but, so she never knew about me and Baco. My dad's looking at the camera and he's laughing with his eyes all squinched up. Baco looks like that when she smiles too. I think he was a really happy kind of guy. That's what everyone says, always joking. If he hadn't died, there would have been more laughing in our house. Mama is not the laughing type. Mama works for old man Anderson at the store, cleaning and doing the washing of all and all that. She also does sewing to sell, boots and mittens and martin hats. She sews real good. She never stops working. If she isn't at the store, she's home baking bread, making duck soup, or cooking ptarmigan, or whatever we have to eat that day. And when it's finished, she'll take out her sewing. Mama thinks working hard is what everyone's supposed to do, and so she thinks school is just a waste of time. Grandpa runs a little trap line out of the village, and he gives Mama skins from the marten and rabbit he traps to make hats and furs. And sometimes he gets wolverines for ruffs, the fur trim around the hood. Wolverine is the best for that because it doesn't frost up like other fur. It's a lot of work sewing. First, she has to scrape those skins with a special little knife until they're soft and there's no fat left on them. Then she washes them and hangs them up to dry on the line by the door. Not too near the stove or they'll dry too fast. While they're drying, she keeps twisting the skin so they won't dry stiff. Me and Baco have to do that part mostly. Mama makes mittens out of lots of different kinds of skins. Otter and wolf are good ones, and she gets lots of money for those. The mittens have long braided harnesses so you can tie the mittens up behind you so they won't get in your way if you're working, and they, so they won't get lost. Those harnesses are made of three different bright colors of yarn, and they're prettier than anything you ever saw. They have big pom-poms on them for decorations. Mama gets me and Baco to wrap the yarn around a piece of cardboard about a million times to make those pom-poms fat enough. We get tired of doing it, but in the end, Mama cuts the ends and fluffs them out, and they look so pretty. She makes boots from caribou legs. Caribou is very warm, and the leg of the caribou is just the right shape already. When you, cut the, when you skin the leg out, you just cut it carefully down the front, and there's a fur tube just right for boots. Mama makes an insole of caribou fur for inside the boots, too. And the top of the boot, she sews on a beautiful band that she makes with beads. She always makes flowers on her bands. Grandma says in the old days, they made the design on the bands with porcupine quills. You had to flatten the porcupine quill with your fingernail, and then you sew it flat to the band. Oh, first you dye the quills in different colors. I'd like to see that kind of band, but no one makes it anymore. Too much work, I guess. They use beads instead. There's a lot of stuff they don't make anymore that my grandma tells me about, like rabbit skin underwear she wore when she was little. Long ago, you only wore what the women could make, but now people have catalogs and go to the store. Mama didn't, doesn't make our parkas. She always orders them from the Sears Roebuck catalog because she thinks making parkas is too much trouble. Grandma doesn't like that ordering stuff. She grumbles at Mama in Indian and calls her lazy. Grandma would make the parkas for us herself, but she doesn't sew very much anymore because her eyes are going bad. It doesn't seem like her eyes are bad because she sees everything me and Baco and Mama do, but that's what she says. Grandma makes the sinew thread for sewing out of that big hump on the back of the moose and she tans the moose hide with rotten moose brains. Boy, does that smell bad. She's the one who taught me and Baco to knit and sew. Mama doesn't have the patience for it. She always yells at us when we do something wrong, and then Grandma will frown at, frown at her and say, Sequoia, in this way she has, and put her arms out to us. That means grandchild. Grandma and Grandpa are too old to go out to camp much, so they stay in town all winter, too. They didn't have any sons, only Mama, so it's bad for them in that way. There's too much hard work at the trap line for just women and an old man. There's Martin trapping in the winter, and after Christmas, people go back out for their winter to the winter camping traps to the winter trapping camps for beaver. Spring camp, when people hunt, hunt muskrats, is just before the snow melts, and then we have fish camp in the summer. We all go fishing, me and Baco and Mama, and sometimes Grandma and Grandpa too. That's because all our cousins and aunts and uncles go there too, so there's not so much work. We can all take turns like. Grandpa misses going out trapping, but he says he gets more money making shoes, snowshoes than he would trapping anyway. Old man Anderson buys those to sell in Fairbanks and other places, and he says he could sell as many as Grandpa could turn out because Grandpa's snowshoes are made of birch, so they're really light on your feet. First, Grandpa has to get just the right kind of birch. It has to be straight with no knots. Then he soaks that birch in water until it's soft, just right to tie onto the snowshoe frames. 
After they're ready to come off the frames, Grandma fills the insides of the snowshoes with those rawhide straps that she makes from moose hide. It's really hard to fill those snowshoes, all crisscross like a spider web. I want to learn how. There were lots of things we could learn at home, but I liked the stuff we learned at school too. I wanted to get good at reading so I could read fast like old man Anderson. When the paper comes in the mail from Fairbanks, he reads out loud in the store to everyone, and he goes so fast that everyone tells him to slow down. I'd like to read that fast. So mostly I was glad when we get to stay in town all winter.